Have no fear, friends. The wait is over. Here on the Big Bid Theory, we have important topics up ahead this season. Informed and opinionated guest and crazy bids you can win is back. Of course, crazy bids you can win will never go away. Season 8 of The Little Show is off and running. And by the way, we're adding video in Season 8. That's right. Don't adjust your volume. Don't adjust your audio. You can now listen to our conversations with a special guest right here on the audio version of the podcast. But you can also head over to Bid Prime's YouTube channel, The Big Bid Theory Playlist, and you can watch and listen. And by the way, no jokes about the non-Hollywood looks of the host, if you don't mind. I am your humble host, Bill Colhane. Rick, Rick Jennings, of course, is back. Powered by Bid Prime, this is indeed the Big Bid Theory. In this episode, very shortly, in a moment, a familiar friend will visit to talk about public health, some key takeaways from the COVID pandemic, how it has impacted staffing across many areas of healthcare, and a lot more our special guest is going to share with us. So don't miss it. Stick around. Me, I've been busy on a number of projects, done a little bit and just a a tiny bit of traveling and also been involved in a little bit of broadcasting as well from a prior life of mine. That's what I've been up to since the end of season seven. And as I look out across the studio here, Rick, you've been, I know, incredibly busy. You and I, of course, have stayed in touch. If you would share with the audience what you've been up to to keep yourself busy. Hey, thanks, Bill. And it is great to be back. Uh, Yeah, we took some time off. Um, I took that time to really dive into some music that I've been doing on the side, Uh, found myself working on some really comfortable new stuff that I hadn't before. So that was really great. Um, But other than that, just uh, spending some uh, time with our uh, friends and family over at Bid Prime and uh, just kind of rolling along. But uh, always just anticipating getting back to the big bid theory. And here we are. Yeah, there is no doubt about it, folks. Full disclosure, Rick is a a busy guy. Speaking of busy, throughout Season 8, Rick is going to have a crazy bid in each episode. Our longtime listeners know exactly what I'm talking about. And and Rick, what do you have ahead this time in Crazy Bids? And I'm so glad I found this particular one for a crazy bid for this episode. Um, I guess I'll kind of uh, throw the teaser out that it deals with one of my biggest fears, if not probably my biggest fear. Um, so stay tuned to find out what that might be. First of season eight, Crazy Bids, as Rick just mentioned, is ahead. Be sure to stick around for that. Uh, Dr. Rodney Rohde, Texas State University, proud Bobcat, San Marcos River, professor, chair. He's a speaker, presenter, sought after, noted expert by many across many walks of life. He's our resident expert on public health, is standing by after this quick message. The Big Bid Theory is brought to you in part by Bid Prime. Over 11 years in changing the bid services industry, Bid Prime has become the solution for businesses serious about winning public sector business. From the premier technology in the industry to real-time bid notifications, supporting documents, and robust data tools, it's all backed by unmatched, personalized customer support. Bid Prime. Start your free zero-obligation trial today. BidPrime.com. Over the past two years, so much going on. COVID has impacted so many aspects of society around the globe, not just, of course, here in the United States. Everybody knows that. In our offices, in our offices here, we've seen a substantial and an enormous increase in public sector requests for PPE related hygiene, sanitation requests supporting how we build, work, interact, communicate with one another. Dr. Rohde shares his invaluable insights right now. Dr. Rohde, how are things down in San Marcos today? Things are great, Bill. Again, thanks for having me on. It's always an honor and a privilege uh, to join you guys. I'm excited to talk about today's topic. Yeah, a little bit of history, uh, first of all, before we em- embark on this episode. Uh, again, Dr. Rohde, uh, the name, the voice, not foreign to our longtime listeners, now viewers, but it was back in 2016. We went into the history books. That was the very first episode. You and I, I don't know if you remember, but we discussed Zika. Yeah, I do point. remember that. Yeah, and then you hit the fast forward button, and it was March 10th of 2020 when you and I got behind the microphones 
on the audio version of the show. And we discussed what was kind of a new story at that time, COVID. Here we are two plus years later. Right. Right. You so, know, it's, it's it's an unbelievable, uh, surreal thing to think about, right? That it's been, yeah. I guess, six years since we first talked. But even that pandemic beginning is almost kind of surreal to think about. Yeah. And the date, again, when we kind of went through the history books, I thought March 10th. That wasn't long after the major networks were talking about it and it became a topic. So uh, there is a little bit of pride, quite honestly, on this side that we were so early on, again, bringing an expert like you on the show. So something, again, we kind of uh, tip our, our own cap um, that we were talking about it back then. But anyway, I do want to go through Dr. Rohde, if you'll bear with me, Dr. Rohde, your, your background a little bit, even though, again, you're not a uh, stranger to to many of our listeners and viewers, but Dr. Rohde is the professor and chair of the Clinical Laboratory Science Program there at Texas State in San Marvelous, as we joke. Also, among his many roles, he is the program chair for the CLS program and holds the rank of professor in the College of Health Professionals, Health Professions, excuse me. Dr. Rohde also serves as associate director for the Texas State University Translational Health Research Center. And I could go on and on. If you look at Dr. Rohde's bio, uh, Dr. Rohde, did I miss any of your key roles there, here, everywhere? That is plenty of the roles and the hats that I wear, as we both do. Yeah. yeah, no doubt about it. Okay, so off we go. So newsflash, uh, COVID is still here. Two plus years since COVID was first reported, we talked about it, we visited here on the show. So as you look back, Dr. Rohde, and by the way, we don't politicize things here on the Big Bid Theory. That show is over there, or the podcast is over there, if you want to talk about the politics. But in terms of public health in the United States of America, over the past year or two, what have been some of the good things that you and your peers have observed? And what are some of the things that we still need to get better at? Oh, wow. Yeah. Great topic. Great lead off on this two and a half years later, Bill. So just yeah. a quick snapshot. Um, we just passed the one million uh, mortality figure in the United States, which is you know very sad. And, and most experts globally are talking about this. Um, you know, the numbers show around five to six million, but many, many people believe that that's a hidden kind of uh, number that we might be looking at 10 to 15 million dead just because of unreported deaths in certain developing countries and things like that. And, and I, I tend to agree with that. I think it's going to be much more significant when we look back historically. You know, when I talk about kind of what what we're opening up with, again, two and a half years ago when we when we chatted about this and, you know, we didn't know a lot. It was a novel virus. It was brand new. And as you and I have talked about, and I've talked with so many others, it took a while and it's still taking a while for some people to kind of understand that with a novel virus, things are changing rapidly, almost in real time. Viruses are the most notorious mutators on the planet and science can't stay up with that sometimes in real time. So we've learned some lessons, Bill, um, some the hard way. Uh, some things we got right, some things we didn't. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit, a few minutes about what I think are some of the big pieces. There's a lot to unpack here. So certainly we can't get to everything. But I really look at this pandemic now, two and a half years later, in terms of kind of my, my background. I look at it in a, a public health slant, kind of the world, the U.S., kind of what's kind of happened. And also in a healthcare slant, because I think there is a snitch Kind of specialized area there for healthcare, but when you think globally, you know I think one of the good things <clears throat> that came out of this, if you look back, was how amazing uh, the warp speed and the ability to transform a vaccine really in about 300 days from the time we need the genomic sequence to the actual authorization of a COVID-19 vaccine. That is in itself a miracle. Uh, most vaccines take years, some five, six, seven years to really get through the pipeline. So I think one good thing, I mean, one of the top things in my mind, public health wise, is that the U.S. government and many others, you know, went into this, you know, we have to do something. We have to get rid of some of the red tape. 
We have to move things through. And they did it in a way, I believe, at the time is the safest way they could. They still pushed it through FDA approval and things like that. And we got it on the market. You remember that thing came out and, and we started rolling out vaccination. The acceptance of vaccination, vaccine equity across the world are different problems. We, we still know that in the U.S. we're approaching only about 65 to 70 percent fully vaccinated. We need to be better with that to even today. And globally, it's it's problematic uh, from from the standpoint of equity and money and, and economics and things like that. So that's, I think, you know, kind of a good and bad point. I think I think we all know now that. Um, really, you know, science communication and trust in our healthcare systems and our public health systems have been challenged. Again, I think that is something we need. We need to learn that lesson, uh, myself included, going forward, that we're going to have to get together. This is one of many things a lot of my colleagues are talking about. I tend to agree. We need a commission, Bill, a global commission, if not in the U.S., looking at what happened. It's still happening, but really looking at it in hindsight and going forward and trying to see where we went wrong and, and trying to see where we went right. And doing it, as you started with, in a non-political way, totally looking at it from a kind of a military, you know, boots on the ground. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? And, and create tabletop exercises, create uh, ways to empower uh, healthcare at the local, state, national, and global level. Because speed is of the essence during a pandemic. You really don't have time to sit around a table when it's happening. I mean, you you do that, of course, but every minute it is a life. And so literally you have to be moving quickly. So I think that needs to happen. I think we've also learned, Bill, and I know you, you've talked about this and we've talked about this all fair and I've talked about it with a number of people, when you look at what's happened in the past two and a half years, I think if you think about education and schools, um, I'm kind of switching back into the public health hat here. I think we have seen that they're really um, what you might consider kind of at the top of the pyramid for a functioning society. You know, I think we knew that as a society, but I think certainly when shutdowns happened and all of these children and adults at college level ended up at home, you know, it impacted, it impacted things like mental health. It impacted uh, a parent's ability to make a decision. How do I deal with this? Can I stay home? Do I have enough time to stay home and handle this sort of thing? And so I think, again, going forward and, and analyzing while technology is beautiful and we're doing it right now, uh, Zooming and doing the things we're doing globally now, it may not ultimately replace the need for human contact, human interaction, uh, from a mental health aspect, it's I think it it's really impacted our society across the, the world. I think it's changed the way we work. Who would have thought, you know, three or four years ago that we would be holding global conferences uh, that entire universities, including Texas State, pivoted uh, to at least in most areas, not so much in healthcare areas, but in most areas, pivoted to online virtual learning. I myself have said it before was not a fan of that uh, prior to the pandemic. And I still believe in certain things like healthcare, you have to get in the water to swim. You have to be in the classroom. You have to be in the laboratories. But in certain other areas, it, it's a very impactful tool. It makes the world smaller. You know, we've had classrooms where we're talking with people from Africa now and and, and other places around the world. Uh, just really helps with some of that cultural learning and things like that. So done right, and done correctly, I think uh, work world is different. I mean, we're seeing it all over the place. And if I could flip just a minute, Bill, to um, healthcare, kind of a different uh, commentary here, because I think in healthcare, and we've learned some lessons around, um, we have to find a way to prepare for this massive increase in service demand. I know you have loved ones in healthcare, my mother ex had to experience healthcare right at the beginning of the pandemic. And while we always have known if something happens, even, even something as simple or tragic as a multi-car fatality or, a, or a, a short outbreak with influenza or something like that, 
and this massive need for services for blood, right? Even coming from the lab standpoint, when you need blood or when you need uh, ventilators that we all saw, or you need supplies, we have to think about that supply chain. That is a core issue that's still going on. Um, and it's certainly impacting healthcare and other areas of our society. But, you know, I could go on and on in the healthcare side of things, uh, but one that I'll mention, and maybe you have some more questions for me is, um, personnel. And we've talked about it before. You cannot create healthcare professionals overnight. It takes years uh, and it takes a pipeline of recruitment and retention to have enough healthcare professionals in the world. And some of the data we're seeing in the medical laboratory and nursing and other areas that are critical to patient care. I, you know, Bill, I, I've talked about it as being kind of a hidden national crisis, and I don't think it's as hidden anymore but I still think people don't realize how critical and um, fragile our healthcare system is from the personnel side, from expertise. People are burnt out, uh, people are tired, and they're, what's sad is they're not just leaving a particular area, they're leaving for good. Uh, they're switching careers and becoming a realtors and things like that. So I'll kind of slow down here and, and let you uh, pick my brain a little bit. Yeah, well, th thank you, Dr. Rudy. That's a great entree. And many of the things that you touched upon, we've actually addressed on this show. Right. And you, you mentioned my wife, and it's not news to anybody who's watched this show for a while. My, my wife is a nurse. And, and yes, I remember the last time you and I visited, you kicked off season seven of the show. And you talked about the, the crisis when it comes to to medical lab professionals and and. I guess my question here is, in our day jobs, we see public sector entities, they outsource for many things, and that includes lab services, that includes requests for lab supplies, lab construction. As a matter of fact, I just saw a request for lab construction that came across the desk literally just today. So there is a lot going on in terms of public sector entities going out and requesting staff and supplies right. and, and whatnot but you, you talked about the the mass exodus well uh, and i hate to say this but in short what can be done to kind yeah, of stem the tide yeah that's that is a great question and one that we're still investigating i, I just started a i just got invited by the american society for clinical pathology to sit on a workforce shortage committee so again a national level committee to start look at, at our profession medical labs you already mentioned nursing so it's not just us it's healthcare, yeah. including physicians and others that you know are dealing with fatigue mental health issues burnout all the things we've talked about retirements uh, and so I, I don't know if there's one perfect answer, but we certainly have to find a way uh, to bring in more professionals, right? So recruitment is ongoing and important, but also retention. Uh, that's really where we're kind of bleeding, uh, so to speak. So many people leaving and we really can't replace them quickly. One one comment and one, and this isn't just my idea, other people have talked about is we may have to look at better ways for the United States, for example, and Texas to um, empower and allow a more uh, rapid but accurate process for foreign experts to work in the U.S. I mean, it's just it's where we are. Um, of course, we have to do it properly and make sure the credentials are right and their expertise is uh, satisfactory to our standards. But we may have to find a way to, again, to cut some of that red tape down, again, safely and accurately. These are not easy things, as you know, in the world we live in from a, from a security standpoint. But I think we're there. Uh, and I think it's happening anyway uh, with respect to being a little slower process, but it's certainly happening. One of the ongoing issues, Bill, this doesn't answer your question per se, but in nursing and medical lab, these two are really important areas in respiratory therapy um, because, you know, with ventilation. So kind of talking about COVID, these particular areas, I call it the free agency effect, right? So an analogy with sports, uh, we all love free agency when you get the right player and they make your team better. And, and that's true in healthcare. The danger, Bill, is when you suck away the seasoned veteran from a hospital that that has no other veterans or very few. And so the analogy is that you may help Hospital X in, in uh, Midland, Texas, 
because you offered them a $20,000 signing bonus and that's happening in the medical lab in a better hourly rate. But now Austin, where they left, particular hospital is is devoid of a an expert in blood bank. And you just don't find those overnight. Um, you can't even with trading and trying to do this across the U.S. It's yeah. really difficult. So it's become a free agency effect. Good for our salaries. Right. Our, our, our professionals like that. Uh, but we're really hurting communities uh, by pulling seasoned yeah. veterans. away. that's just one one issue. And so I don't know how to address that, uh, but it's one thing we need to figure out. Yeah, and it's certainly a reality, reality, no doubt, travel nurses yes. um, increase in that and, and all that. And one of the things we've also seen an increase in, uh, again, to kind of circle back to the start of the pandemic a couple of years ago, and again, I refer to our day jobs here, but we have noted, and it isn't a news flash again, but thousands upon thousands of requests for PPE every variety of PPE that you could conceive of, it's out there, state, local, federal, universities, K through 12, law enforcement, putting in requests for different items, different services. And one of the things we've also noticed, and we look at the data quite often and thoroughly, but there's been an increase in solutions, services, and products related to hygiene and sanitation. So right. you have a number of government agencies watching right now, Dr. Rohde, private business leaders watching right now, school administrators. So when it comes to hygiene and sanitation, what would you recommend if they aren't doing it already? What would you recommend they do right now? Yeah, again, a very complex and nuanced uh, situation. Certainly PPE, sure. PPE and infection prevention and control are critical. It always has been. <clears throat> and I think I'll try to address this in a couple of ways. One way in healthcare, I think we're looking at uh, many areas in healthcare now where masking and other types of PA, PPE may become more mandatory. Uh, what we've absolutely seen, the data shows this. Uh, again and again, I talk about it. It shows it that we have absolutely lowered and sometimes almost eliminated respiratory types of infections within healthcare, occurring by wearing good, effective masks. Um, and again, that's a whole other show on the types of masks, but certainly good and effective masks. Uh, and we just know it ha it works, Bill. It, it absolutely works. Does it? Do you need it every day in society? Which is a different topic. Maybe not. But in healthcare, we're really seeing the uh, pluses of that. So I think. Uh, that going forward will be something you see more healthcare professionals wearing masks, maybe all the time uh, going forward, especially in, in immunocompromised areas, long-term care, ICUs, things like that. But even when people come in to visit, I think you're going to see more mandates on, you know, unless something changes nationally, that if you're coming into our hospital and you're, whether we know it or not, uh, we're, we're going to enforce a mask and hand hygiene and things like that before you go in to visit grandma or someone who's an ICU. So I think that's gonna occur. Uh, in, the, in the other part of the world with respect to infection uh, control and prevention, this is an area you know I work in, and very nuanced and complex, but um, the topic of smart buildings is really bouncing around the world uh, with respect to as we build new buildings and maybe renovate old buildings. You know, we saw it here at Texas State, um, you know, thinking about smart materials that don't harbor microbes as well. So getting down to the root cause of surfaces being an issue mm -hmm. and really more so than that, Bill. Uh, and if you, you might remember this when we talked two, two and a half years ago. Everybody was freaking out about surfaces. Uh, and I think it was a good place to start. You know, you worry about things being on the surface when it's something so novel. But in reality, looking backwards, maybe not as big a problem for this particular bug is something like a, a bacterium or, or a fungus or something that's more hardy in the environment. Having said that, what is important is air turnover and air control. So if you're in that space, and if you're not, I'd encourage you to look at it, you're seeing a lot of research and effort in air, um, turnover of air. You know, we know in an airplane, they turn it over. And by that, if your audience doesn't know what that means, it's the exchange of air in a building or in an airplane or a bus or anywhere else. It's really important. It's why we want to go outside, get outside to do things. It's safer. It's always safer to be outside. So that air turnover, turnover I think, is going to be an important conversation as we go forward. Very good. And Dr. Rohde, obviously, we would not, would not allow ourselves 
to end this interview without asking you about lab professionals. I'm looking at my calendar here. Medical Laboratory Professionals Week was the end of April, and we save lives every day. I know it's a mantra of yours. You are so passionate about your industry, about what you and your peers and everybody involved, uh, what you do to help society. So before we exit stage left, is there anything coming up on the lab professionals calendar that you'd like to share with our audience? Sure, I'd love to. Thank you again for that opportunity. And again, thank you for um, mentioning lab week. That was a couple of weeks ago. I know nurses week is just completed. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me start there. You know, healthcare professionals, you know, I think sometimes we get, just like everybody else in the world, we tend to get into silos. Uh, and we all are important. Uh, you absolutely need every one of us doing our jobs accurately and correctly every day, 365 a year, right? So we, we all are important, right? Nursing, medical laboratory, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, across the board are important. But with respect to medical laboratory professionals, we always like to say that we're the backbone of healthcare and public health. Without us, you know, your physicians and others are basically guessing. You cannot do anything without medical laboratory data. And coming up, um, two things that I'm involved with that most of the U.S. is, is we have two big national uh, meetings coming up this June. I'll actually be speaking on how to be a subject matter expert uh, from a medical lab standpoint at the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science. It's going to be in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the end of June. And then in September, the American Society for Clinical Pathology will have their big 100th annual meeting, and I'll be a part of that. And that's just two of them, Bill, at the national level. There are many state and regional meetings that are going on all the time. And if anybody in your audience has children, uh, nephews and nieces, grandkids that are interested in science and math and you know, even if they're thinking medical school or things like that, don't forget about these other amazing healthcare professionals, including the medical lab, diagnostic detectives. So if you're interested in that sort of world, check it out, look me up. I'm happy to talk to anybody. We need you in our in our sites for the future. All right, well, Dr. Rohde, again, can't express enough how much we appreciate you helping us yet again, visiting with us on the very first video edition of the Big Bid Theory. Thank you so much, Bill, and have a great, great year. All right, you as well. Again, many enormous thanks to our friend, Dr. Rodney Rohde. And Rick, I look over there, and, and it's so good to see you officially back in studio. Crazy bitch, you can win. Let's have it. All right, Bill. I want to set a very high bar for this uh, season because... I mean, we all know there is no shortage of uh, bids from all around the public sector, and uh, chances are some of them are going to be pretty crazy, and hopefully I can highlight that um, as best as I've done this season. Uh, now, I teased earlier, so th uh, this particular bid has to do with one of my biggest fears. One of my biggest fears is alligators crocodiles and uh, anything in that general family because there's nothing more terrifying than something that can be just lying out on a on a swamp or a riverbank and then dart towards you at 170 miles an hour however fast they go um, but this bid doesn't really have anything to do with how terrifying uh, these creatures are. Um, and this uh, particular crazy bid comes from the Florida Department of Transportation. This bid is titled Alligator Alley Environmental Education Product, uh, Project. Uh, so what what is this bid exactly looking for? Well, if I dive into the scope of services here on their um, document for Exhibit A, it says it is the intent of the Florida Department of Transportation to commission an artist or vendor to provide an original true life statue of the American alligator, Alligator Mississippiensis. Uh, the artwork shall celebrate the Everglades and delight visitors at the mile marker 35 rest area located on I-75 Alligator Alley. Um, now, I haven't been to Alligator Alley. It doesn't sound like something that um, I'd be too thrilled about considering uh, my fears. But uh, this was just something really neat to see in that there was there's a bid specifically for somebody to create a bronze statue of an alligator, which is just awesome to see that um, something like this is going out. So 
I don't know if you are uh, if you are an artist who is qualified to work with the U.S. government, then uh, hopefully I gave you on a, a great lead on this episode's crazy bid that you can win. That there, folks, is excellence. Rick, you've set a high bar for see for season eight. Many thanks to you for tuning in, sharing, downloading, and following the Big Bit Theory. And thanks for the emails, by the way, during our break, and and keep them coming. Is there a particular guest you think we should look into? Topic ideas. Let us have it. Send them on over. You can email me at bcolhane at bidprime.com. Please follow us on Twitter if you aren't already doing so, at the Big Bid Theory. And as you know, my personal Twitter is contract underscore Hunter. You can also find us on Facebook, LinkedIn. And as you know now, you can also find our interviews over on Bid Prime's YouTube channel as well. Powered by Bid Prime, thanks again to Dr. Rohde. Have you thanked a lab professional or other healthcare provider recently? Scary world without those folks, isn't it? On behalf of Rick Jennings and our team of all-stars, this is Bill Colhane. Until next time, go Gunners, Barracudas, Tigers, Bobcats, and Cubs, and we wish you all the best in growing your business. Powered by Bid Prime, we thank you for tuning in to The Big Bid Theory. From Austin, Texas, the show is produced by Bill Colhane and Jim Ward. Producer and engineer is Rick Jennings. Distribution, research, and production assistance by Kevin Henderson. You can find other episodes of the show on platforms such as iHeart, iTunes, Spreaker, Google Play, Stitcher, among others. As always, thank you for downloading and sharing the podcast. We're having so much fun. So much fun.